Tonight's our chance to ask some quantum questions. We're hearing a lot of late about a new kind of computer based on the surprising physics of the quantum world. The basic switches of these quantum computers aren't just on or off, but also blends of the two. With this, some see the promise of incredibly powerful computations for scientific and engineering modeling, artificial intelligence, cryptography, and analyzing big data. Academic research labs, startups, and tech giants are all making significant bets on making quantum computing a reality. But what exactly is quantum computing? And what distinguishes it from the computers we use today? What are the different approaches to making a quantum computer? And what impact could quantum computing have on our lives? We have some great guests tonight to help answer these questions for us. Pat Gooman is a researcher at IBM and team lead for quantum system integration in cryogenics. He comes to IBM from a variety of research positions, including at Harvard's Department of Physics, where he investigated a range of topics from quantum fluids to quantum sensing. Matthias Troyer is a principal researcher in the quantum group at Microsoft. He is a professor of computational physics at the ETH in Zurich, where he has been on leave since 2017 for this work with Microsoft. Matthias received the Raman Prize for Computational Physics of the American Physical Society and is a trustee of the Aspen Center for Physics. John Martinez is a research scientist at Google, where he is leading Google AI's quantum team's hardware effort to build quantum computing processors. John holds the Worcester Chair in Experimental Physics at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and has been a noted contributor to superconducting elect electronics from his PhD at Berkeley in the late 1980s. So won't you join me in welcoming to the stage Pat Gooman, Matthias Troyer, and John Martinez. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, I thought we could maybe begin with um, one of the most basic and probably most uh, potentially most interesting questions of the night. What is quantum computing? Uh, so which of you would like to take a stab at that for us to begin? Well, let, let me start maybe, and my colleagues can continue. Um, it's hard to talk about quantum computing without making a reference to classical computing. And let me just be brief on that. Many of you know how a classical, classical computers work. They operate using zeros and one binary system. Quantum computing is actually an entirely different paradigm of computing. It's, it, it builds on a very beautiful physics theory called quantum mechanics, which governs our micro world. And it's very much counterintuitive. It's something which is hidden from, from, from the view. And we do not experience that in our day-to-day -day life. And I'm talking about effects like superposition, entanglement, or, or interference. And these kind of effects we take and we apply to build a quantum computers. And quantum computers can potentially be very powerful uh, computing machines outperforming classical computers soon in years to come. Matthias, um, if, if, if quantum computing is based on kind of this uh, weird and unfamiliar physics of quantum mechanics, um, you know, could you, could you add to what Pat has said and help us understand, you know, what are some of these novel, unusual phenomena to many of us that, that are involved? Yeah, so when we build computers, we just use what to, uh, be, be uh, uh, know of nature, Chandigarh, how it works, to build a, 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 a device that solves certain problems. And when we're faced with the problems of, in chemistry, for example, in quantum physics, this weird physics, if you want to describe that on a, 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 a classical, computer, that's where they reach a limit. Mm -hmm. But now the idea 
of Feynman was that if nature is so hard to simulate because nature is quantum mechanical, then to solve it, we just have to embrace the quantum nature of nature and use a quantum device to simulate nature. And so we just use nature itself, how the 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 world works to simulate nature. That's native and easy for chemistry the problems, problems, material science problems, physics problems. The breakthrough was to use it also for math problems, mm -hmm. factoring numbers, solving equations. So it's a way of kind of using physics in a smart way to, 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 to uh, solve problems. In that sense, it's no, not so much different than a classical computer, where we learn to, uh, to use physics to solve problems. But we just go deeper in the physics. John, I can, I can understand how the idea of you know, if you have some, some thorny questions about uh, systems where quantum mechanics is at play, to using uh, a device that does calculations itself using quantum mechanics, you know, you can get kind of an intuition about that. They match, you know. Yeah. But for, for doing things like, um, you know, the sort of computations maybe we're familiar with from our daily lives, the kind of math we're familiar with our from our daily lives. How do, um, how do quantum computers use this kind of novel physics to do ordinary math? Okay. So um, one way to think about the important concept of superposition is to think about how an atom works where you have a, let's say, hydrogen atom, a proton, an electron around it. If these are classical objects, like we treat information, the proton and the electron would attract each other, and the atom would have no size. Okay, clearly that's the wrong model. <laughs> and quantum mechanics says that the electron is actually at all the different positions at the same time in a cloud, and we call that superposition. And the amazing thing about quantum computing and the laws of physics is that you can kind of abstract this idea of superposition, electron around a proton, into the actual states zero and one, and you can be both in zero and one at the same time in this superposition state. Now, the way you use that for a computer is, is essentially making a parallel processor where you can put this state of both zero and one at the same time through your processor and compute what happens to that at the same time. Now, for a single qubit, you know, factor two is great, but what's interesting is if you have two qubits, you now have four states, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, three qubits is eight, four is 16. So this kind of parallelization is growing exponentially with the number, so you get an exponential amount of uh, kind of this parallel processing as you get the qubits. So the number I like to, to talk about is 333 qubits because 2 to the 333 is about a Google of processing, which clearly for us is, is an interesting <laughs> limit that hopefully we'll get to. <laughs> now, I want to say that this is a kind of a general way. The problem is you don't have access to all that information. So you have to do a measurement and you just get n bits of information, you get a minimal amount of information. So you have to code up, your software has to be written very carefully to take into account that you can't get that much information. But if you can, there are routine, there are software algorithms that do that, and then you can pick up uh, you know, this parallel processing power. Let's back up with just one step for people. And you mentioned the idea of a qubit. And I think um, many people will know that in kind of what we might call, for the purposes of this discussion, conventional computing, conventional digital electronic computing. Um, they're based on, uh, these machines are based on switches, transistors mostly, and they um, ideally are either on or off. And um, it sounds like, in a way, the qubit is the analogous fundamental component of quantum computers, and that they're on or off 
or some smear of both. Is that, there, does that get at it at all? There can be in any linear combination of zero and one. So the best way of, to think about it is you picture, if you picture a sphere, and in physics we call it a, a block sphere, and if you have a vector, just a narrow point pointing towards the upper north pole, uh -huh. we can denote that vector as state number one. And another one pointing towards the south pole, and that's zero. You can basically create, using quantum computers, any linear combination of those two, as John said, zero and one, on this, on this sphere. And that will be your superposition state. Where, when it comes to actual physical qubits, there's so many flavors of them out there. And uh, the three of us are, are pursuing two different quantum computing architectures. Uh, IBM is trying to build superconducting qubit-based quantum computers, uh -huh. and those are microwave circuits fabricated on 200 millimeter silicon wafers, which are then diced and, and packaged uh, using regular printed circuit boards uh, and, and microwave solutions technologies. Uh, but the metal which we put on the, on the silicon is quite different what we use in classical CMOS technology. Uh, we're using superconducting metals. And one of them is niobium, and the other one is aluminum. Mm -hmm. uh, aluminum and niobium have very specific properties. If you cool them down below something which is called TC, critical temperature, they become superconducting, meaning that the resistivity, the resistance of that metal drops down to zero. It's literally zero ohm, which means it's a dis dissipationist-less object where, where the electrons form special objects called Cooper pairs, and they flow without any resistance through that, through that circuit. There is a lot we can talk about, but that's basically a fundamental block for us. People try to develop other quantum architectures like phosphorus atoms in silicon, which can be controlled also using microwave. Uh, uh, pulses, as well as nitrogen vacancy centers in diamond. You would never believe that diamond can be a, a quantum computer architecture. Well, it's still far away, but you can put a nitrogen atom um, inside the diamond crystal, and it brings on this, this vacancy, which you can control optically using green lasers and microwave pulses. And so there are these many different possible routes to creating this crafting a little piece of material so that it will exhibit this, this kind of character of a qubit. Um, and um, I think we'll get in maybe a minute to talk about each of your different approaches. Um, but I want to pull back the focus yet again to talk about um, a little bit, if we could talk briefly about where did this idea first arise for using the physics of quantum mechanics to create a kind of a, a new approach to doing computation. Yes. So, Matthias, would you like so to? So one of the first was Richard Feynman, who talked about how, how hard it is to, to, to simulate nature on a classical computer. Because if a single quantum bit or a single a, a quantum spin can be in two states, up and down, when you have two of them, you have four states. When you have 10, you have 1,000. When you have 20, you have a million. When you have 260, you have more than there are particles in the visible universe. <laughs> so when you have 260 of these quantum particles with two states each, you cannot store their state on any classical computer that's smaller than the universe. <laughs> and faced <laughs> with this problem, Feynman then said, okay, but nature, of course, can do it because my 260 quantum particles, of course, are in their state. And so then he said, let's build a computer that just embraces this quantum nature of the, <laughs> the universe and use it to simulate nature, quantum physics at first. John, it seems like that, um, let's say, you know, if we imagine we have these, some selection of qubits, maybe less than 300 and whatever it was, and that gives us access to, um, you know, a set of qubits that have this astonishing number of possible states that they can represent. Um, and use that kind of fecundity of all these states to, to do computation. Um, 
it seems, uh, as we'll talk about more, hard to do. What do we get if we do that? Like, let's say you know, we have a quantum processor that has whatever, 100 qubits. What, what sort of possibility does that potentially open? Um, yeah, the, the building a quantum computer is hard, and then that's one of the things <laughs> that I do. And then figuring out what kind of software and algorithms to run on a quantum computer is also a very difficult problem. So, uh, and it, I, I, that's not my area of expertise, but um, one of the, the kind of the two things that we're focusing on uh, in our group is one is the quantum chemistry, as Matthias was talking about, uh, where uh, you can uh, compute uh, the chemical properties of atoms and molecules uh, using your quantum computer. And you have to map this quantum problem of the electrons and the nucleus to a quantum bits. And people know how to do that now. And you know, Feynman proposed that in the kind of early 80s, and it was kind of in the late 2000s that people kind of started understanding how to do that. And it's only been, say, in the last 10 years, and Matthias has been proud of that, and our group and Google is doing that too, that people actually kind of figured out how to do that in an efficient enough way to do it. And I like this application is because we kind of know how to do it right now, and we can understand the resources and uh, you know, do that right now. The, the problem is you have to do quantum error correction, which we'll talk about later. But the whole, that whole computer is something like a million qubits. And the, the qubits have to be really pretty good qubits, better than what we know how to do. So we see that as a, you know, a, a more distant goal. Uh, we're at you know, 10 to 50 right now. Uh, so uh, you know, it, we have a long way to go. The story I like to tell there is when I was growing up, I remember my dad getting excited buying, buying a transistor radio with, I don't know, five transistors. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, this was really yeah. great. And then you know, nowadays, what we have the cell phone uh, in our pocket, that's what, about a trillion transistors. So you know, we have a long ways to go, but you know, uh, you know, we, we have to try and see, see if we can get there. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the level. Then there's a whole different application of, say, machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, function optimization, data optimization, which we're interested in, many other people are interested in. Uh, and that's more of a heuristic kind of algorithms and people are working on it, but there's clearly some interesting things to think about there. Let me just add yes. to that uh, quickly. Uh, that conference where Feynman proposed that challenge, which Matthias mentioned, was in, in 1981. It was organized by MIT and IBM and a bunch of physicists got together and, and, and Richard proposed that, that if you really want to simulate quantum and the nature, uh, which is quantum, you need to build a quantum computer. But a few years earlier before that, uh, Charlie Bennett, who's actually an IBM fellow, was the first one who uh, created and come up with the term of quantum information, hmm. information. and he based that off, uh, based on that own work of uh, Rolf Landau, Landau who was another IBM fellow. So that was late, late 70s. OK. Um, before we turn to talk about your individual uh, research efforts at, at quantum computing, I wanted to talk about something that many people may have heard about with conventional computers, computing as we know it. Um, the idea that um, the phrase Turing complete, complete computing, or that uh, the idea of um, Turing complete computers as a universal tool. That is to say that the digital computers that we've come to know, in principle, can do uh, any computation yeah. that uh, any computation. Um, I think it would be interesting for people to know, you know, how does quantum computing compare with conventional computing on that score of universality? And also, is there kind of a competition between, potentially a co competition between quantum computing and conventional computing? Matthias. So in principle, quantum computers can solve the same problem that classical ones can solve. Things that we cannot compute, we can't on quantum either. Like when, uh, I, I tell you, this sentence is false. 
you cannot tell me whether it's true or false. <laughs> so, and quantum computers will not help with that either. So it's the same type of problems you solve. And quantum computers are also so Turing complete. So you can run any classical program you have on a quantum computer. But if you only have 100 qubits, then you can run only a program with 100 bits on it. And you would not waste your 100 qubits to do a classical computation. <laughs> Where the difference is that if you have 100 quantum bits, then there are some calculations you can do on them that would take 2 to the power of, power of 100 classical memory to do. <laughs> so you can do the same things, but you may need exponential more time or exponentially uh, more memory. And that easily gets to the point where, in principle, theoretically, you can do it, but it would take the age of the universe to do a calculation that a quantum computer can solve in minutes. And that's when there's no theoretical difference, but there's a true practical difference <laughs> whether they wait a minute or a billion years. <laughs> so, and it's those problems uh, we look for that I could just not imagine solving ever on any classical computer, but that they can solve in practice once they have a hundred thousand or a million qubits. And that's where the difference, what I can do in my lifetime versus in principle. I, I would say one should think about this as a special purpose processor yeah. for solving certain kind of problems. And you know, now that the silicon industry, CMOS industry is kind of getting near the end of, of Moore's law, you know, people are building special purpose uh, uh, CPUs and, and uh, other, other things. Uh, Google makes these things called tensor processing units for solving certain machine language problems. So, you know, this is happening in the regular classical computing world, and mm -hmm. there's no surprise that this will happen in the quantum world, too, to, to make a yeah. special purpose process. Mm -hmm. But if I uh, may add to that, having, th there's some misconceptions regarding quantum computing. Uh, we already have small approximate quantum computers, you know, 5, 16, 20 qubit devices, and so on. Every single one of them is controlled by a classical computer. <laughs> So, <laughs> so classical computers are not going away. We will still need them. Well, we can sleep well at night. <laughs> uh, I'd like to talk about the current state of affairs, which is, um, to my mind, you know, an exciting research field where there's a lot of exploration, a lot of challenges, and a lot of open questions. And I thought we could kind of do a sample of the current state of affairs by having each of you uh, kind of share with us in turn uh, about your current research. And John, perhaps we could start with you. And I think we have some Great. images uh, to accompany yeah, right. So we're right now uh, in the lab. We've built uh, a processor called Bristlecone that's in the lab. Here's a picture of it in the cryostat. It's uh, 72 qubits, although the real point of this processor is not just to make a lot of qubits, but to make them operate with very low error rates and eventually trying to do error correction and do some practical algorithms. Uh, but this is a picture of, of the device. Uh, its device is buried in the center of the bottom there. That's at very low temperatures of about a hundredth of a Kelvin. And then all those wires uh, are connected from the qubit uh, going uh, you know, up the cryostat so that we can, we can control the device. If we can go to the next slide, uh, you'll see a, a, a kind of a side view of it, where you see all the wires coming up and then going down to a rack of electronics. And that's just where we control the computer with essentially just a lot of software to run, calibrate, know what we're doing. Uh, it takes a long time to kind of figure out how to build this up all in a scalable way. Uh, the third uh, picture here actually shows the bristlecone device that's uh, about, uh, I think, a, an inch and a half uh, across or so. Uh, the, this uh, kind of uh, reddish color is what we call the carrier wafer, which has all the wires that connect from the outside of the chip. And then it goes inside the chip, and then it's connected with these indium, it's called bump-ons, to the gray piece. It's just another chip that sits on top of it. 
and that's where we make the qubits and have some magic, uh, you know, processing to make they uh, make sure they uh, they uh, work well. So uh, we've been in testing this since kind of the beginning of the year. Uh, the basic design looks good. We're excited about the prospects of it. It just takes a long time to bring it up and calibrate it, and make sure it's working. Uh, what we're trying to do is if we can get the error rate of these devices really low uh, and get 72 of the qubits to work, we want to do something we call the quantum supremacy experiment. And this is to show that a quantum computer can do powerful computation. Uh, not doing anything useful yet, but just show <laughs> that it's a lot of this parallel, parallel going. It's a basic science question and computer science question. And the basic idea is you'd run that algorithm, and to check if you got the right outputs, you would have to run the equivalent algorithm on a supercomputer, because it's so big, to be able to check it properly. So that's really challenging. We hope to get there, but uh, you know, we're, we're moving, moving forward this year and trying to get everything to work. And yeah, that's hard. It just takes a lot of work by the team. Thank you. Matthias. Yeah, so I want to take a step back to what got me interested in quantum computing. Yes. And it was back in high school, I liked solving science problems with computers because it was nice to write code and fast code and solve problems with it. And then when I got to choose my master's thesis, there was one topic where I knew that's the topic I want to do no matter what it is. But there was one topic where I could use a Cray XMP supercomputer. <laughs> and I said, when I can play with a Cray, then that's what I'll do. <laughs> and the problem there was solving quantum problems on that Cray supercomputer. And that got me to science. And then over the, la the next decades, I found out that there's huge progress that can be made by inventing new algorithms and at the same time using the fastest existing machines. Mm -hmm. So I loved using the, the fastest yes, uh, supercomputers and finding new ways of using them. But Moore's law is limited. The, f the speed of the fastest machine only doubles every year. <laughs> Algorithmic progress is limited, is faster than Moore's law, but we face problems that we could just could not solve. And then having this quantum background, we started thinking more and more about, hey, if I had a Feynman type quantum computer, then I could solve these problems. And so it got time to actually try and get one. And that's why I joined Microsoft to actually help build one. And so we work on the full stack, starting with the qubits. With material science, we need, 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 uh, need new materials, yes, better ones, cleaner ones, as John knows well. <laughs> then we need to make the qubits. Then we need to make the t t control electronics for them. And then on top of that stack, we also need to program it. We need to write the software to uh, control the qubit. We need to write the software that solves problems. And, uh, and that uh, uh, Microsoft, we work on the full stack, materials, mm. fabrication, the qubits, control. And my team works on software. That's both the, the, the tools, the, the, the languages to, to, to program it, the compilers, the libraries, the, 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 the algorithms. But then there's also the question about what will we do if we have one, mm. the applications. If, we, if somebody gave me a quantum computer, what problem would I solve with it? And that's what uh, we work on. When we do that, quite often we find, for example, in chemistry, as mentioned by John, that, as Feynman said, we can do that on a quantum computer. But then we look at the first code and estimate how long would it run. Mm. And then although it's so much faster than a classical computer, the runtime might still turn out to be a thousand years. <laughs> When I see that, then I say, wow, I don't want to wait a thousand years. 
or sometimes it turns out to be 100 million years, and the answer might just be 42. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's why I say I want to bring it down from that, and then it's very important, just like on classical hardware, that you optimize the algorithm. Mm. And that's what we do, kind of, how do we bring these runtimes of algorithms down? How do we invent new algorithms and faster ones, even before we have the machines? <laughs> because we need to be ready with our algorithms and applications when we have a machine. Not then start thinking about, oh, I have this quantum computer now, what should I do with it? Fascinating. Pat. David, you ask about what is the current status of her and my research. Let me start with the latter one. Yeah. And let me say it, it is not my research, and I will not talk about <laughs> my research. It's the research of many of us. And right. there is really a lot of us, uh, including my colleagues from Almaden Research Lab here uh, in California, IBM Zurich Lab, and our main lab in, in Yorktown Heights, New York. Sure. Uh, it's, it's a teamwork, and, and, and has to be viewed like that. And not a single person on this planet can build a quantum computer. <laughs> Uh, and that's how, uh, how we're pursuing it. Um, regarding the current status of affairs, for us, we can basically um, talk about two um, threats. One is IBM Quantum Experience, which is a general public, small quantum computers, which we released back in 2016. Right. Five qubit, 2017, 16 qubit devices, which are on the cloud for free at no cost for you to use. Uh, we created a Qiskit quantum information science, a Kit software, which is an open source software on, on GitHub. Uh, Jay Gambetta and his team put a lot of work into that. And, and it's mainly to educate the future generation of, of, of the next quantum engineers, quantum researchers, to teach yourself about how we can use quantum computers. And the second thread is IBM Q, which is the commercial uh, effort of IBM Corporation trying to commercialize quantum computing. And under that umbrella, we have a 20 qubit device uh, on the cloud for our clients and partners to use. And as John mentioned, it's actually not about the number of qubits. And that's the biggest misconception. I guess we're going to talk about that later on. It's, 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 it's about the number of qubits. It's about the connectivity, the error rates. And it's also about the software, how good your compilers and transpilers are in order to create good quantum gates to have this, this quantum speed up. Hmm. Um, thank you. Uh, one thing that may be um, a question that some people listening may have is um, why do these, why do qubits in these quantum processors have to be so very cold? I don't, you know, the, the, um, the environments in which these processors are operating, help me, are, is, is far colder, if you will, lower temperature than you know, the deepest reaches of outer space. You know? So it's like some really cold pockets of the universe is where these quantum processors have to be. 270 uh, times Why colder. is that? How many? 270 times colder than deep space. Yes. Mm -hmm. Why? Anybody want to take that? So, so um, what happens is if you're at too high of a temperature, then kind of the thermal noise around us uh, kind of disturbs the quantum state and you qubit doesn't work properly. And the way to kind of estimate the temperature is to know the energy of the quantum state and then compare that with K Boltzmann times the temperature, which is the typical energy of that. Now, if you were to make quantum bits out of light, out of photons, visible light, uh, that energy is pretty high, and you can do uh, that kind of computing at room temperature. And in fact, like the NV centers, the diamond NV centers, an example where uh, at least some of those, those things can be done, uh, done properly there. Uh, in the case of uh, our superconducting qubits, we're building microwave circuits which is a way uh, lower frequency. It's typically five, six gigahertz. And uh, in that case, when you set uh, the quantum energy of five, six gigahertz to the temperature, that's about 0.2 Kelvin. And we have to operate about 10 times below that to make sure it, it's doing that. Now, it sounds like really daunting. You have to go to low temperature, and you know, you do it. But um, what's really nice about it is if we are operating at five or six gigahertz, 
the microwave control is actually really simple, hmm. or comparatively simple of other controls. Uh, and you know, mostly well, the main reason is we have all these cell phone equipment out there, mm -hmm. and chips and electronics, where uh, you can build those control systems very cheaply and very easily. So uh, we kind of trade off this temperature problem for a frequency problem and operate in a frequency uh, where, where it's fine. In the end, it's just a gigantic system engineering problem where you have to balance all these different mm -hmm. things. And it just turns out that uh, these refrigerators would sound very difficult. Well, you just buy it and you know how to use it. <laughs> and uh, it, it's, it's just a knob we turn at, at this point. Huh. I, if I can just, which, which, is, please. which is funny to that note. Um, I remember times when I was a graduate student and those refrigerators which we currently use for building quantum computers and incidentally I brought you a little model of one of them which is back there if you want to take a look at it. Uh, they were much smaller and they were called wet systems and what it is, a delicious refrigerator is a fridge which is capable of reaching almost absolute zero temperature as John said about 10 millikelvin temperatures at the lowest stage but it, it comes in, in stages. So we have 0 0.01 Kelvin, 0 0.1 Kelvin, 0 0.7 Kelvin, 4 Kelvin, 50 Kelvin, and room temperature 300 Kelvin. I apologize, in physics we use Kelvin. <laughs> uh, but the, the lowest temperature is negative 459 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 270 degrees Celsius, just to give you a little bit of a, an intuition. Um, when I was a graduate student, those systems required liquid helium to be transferred into big bucket, we call them dewars, almost every four days, because liquid helium would evaporate, and then you would have, you would have to stop your experiment and transfer it again. So you can forget about you know, going on vacation you know, for the next five years. Yeah. <laughs> More importantly, uh, the mixing chamber plate was about two inches, 50 millimeter diameter. You know, as John showed you the pictures of it, or, or if you see that little model, if you want to put 50, 20, or X number of qubits on that little plate, it's, it's just physically not possible. So a lot of technological inventions need to happen for us to have quantum computing to come to life right now, as we speak, within our lifetime. And one of them was the invention of cryocoolers. Uh, those are special instruments based on high pressure compressor. They, 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 they pause a helium-3 gas, which gives you the ability to cool down one of the shields, one of those plates to four Kelvin by only using electricity. So as long as you have juice in your outlet, you can stay cold. And then the next stage of, of cooling the dilution refrigerator case, kicks in. But what I'm getting at, you can keep on adding those cryo coolers to your refrigeration system, as you can see on, on this picture. By the way, this is this picture which you see here. I have to make this comment, I apologize. Please. This, this is why I joined IBM. And it's not because of the quantum computer, which is in the middle. It's because of the love of my life. That's my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, also works at IBM. <laughs> that is an excellent reason. <laughs> so once we add those more, those cryo coolers, we can basically grow the size of our dilution refrigerator and put more electronics, microwave electronics, and qubits on it. In talking to a, a different researcher about this, um, you know, superconducting electronics sounds kind of wild and foreign, but really something that people may have a direct experience of are MRI machines, which use superconducting yeah. uh, magnets to do this imaging. So MRI machines are using a superconducting technology, if you will. And I had heard that much of, which have to be kept very cold as these quantum processors, and I had heard that the technology refinement from making instruments like MRI have actually made um, the refrigerators that are used in this sort of research much more robust and tractable and lowered the cost. Is, is that right? Yeah, and yeah. also a lot of this um, technology of, of cryocoolers were involved with um, baking good vacuum systems and good pumps for that. So it's, it, it, there's been a broad um, technological uh, improvement uh, to, to make these possible. Also, one, one aspect was, was naturally, well, not naturally, but military. Yeah. When you have infrared sensors, you want to keep them cold. Oh. 
so we have a better signal to noise ratio and, and they started working on making those small cryo colors as well as, as space technology for, for satellites or telescope, telescopes. Well, if, if we could, I was thinking it would be interesting to, you know, as you look um, from your labs out into the world, I'd be interested to hear your impressions of, you know, what is the kind of research and competitive landscape like about in quantum computing in terms of different organizations that are pursuing this work and in different geographies? You know, what's the kind of global landscape of quantum computing look like? Anybody want to take a stab at part of that, Matthias? Yeah, so uh, um, until a few years ago, it was mostly academic research. We were working on the qubits. We were working on, on making them or thinking about the, the, uh, the, the, the algorithms. But, was, but that was more theoretical research, far future. And 10 years ago, a friend told me that if we're all lucky, then maybe my grandchildren will see a quantum computer. <laughs> that has changed. There's been rapid progress. And we are at the point now where we have the science against the, the, uh, have, uh, developed here so far that we see a path to build, to, to, to scaling it and to, 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 to building the quantum computer that solves real problem in the next five to 10 years. Mm. And with that, companies got interested in it. And that was really important because to go from a small lab project to building the whole system takes more resources than an academic lab has. Because you have to scale from one qubit or 10 to a million qubits. You need to do the, 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 the systems work, work better. The, the, the refrigerators, the wiring and all has to be done. And that costs much more than academia can afford. Mm. At the same time, we found applications that are worth it for company to invest in it, like in chemistry. And uh, with that now, we have companies like Google, IBM, Microsoft, Intel, and others that invest in it. The landscape is, in Europe, still mostly academic. There's lots of your funding there, there, uh, there for research. Mm -hmm. In the US, funding, I think, is harder to find there. But US companies are willing to bet on it and invest big in that. Then also, Australia invests a lot. And China announced that they invest $10 billion and more over the next five years. Wow. So those are kind of the big players. John, I think, oh, yeah, John I was just going to say, maybe. it's really an exciting time mm -hmm. to be in this field because there's, it's a huge worldwide effort to try to do this and move forward. And as Matthias said, there's, companies have, uh, uh, countries have company-wide programs to uh, fund it, mostly academic, but uh, yep. sometimes a mix of, as for example, in China. Uh, you also have the academic groups, you have companies, you have startup companies right now. So there's a wide variety, and also there's a wide variety of approaches uh, 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 that people are looking at. So it's a really interesting time because you have, have a diverse portfolio of, of things people are doing, and also management approaches, too, of how you're going to yeah. do that. Huh. And, uh, uh, you know, I think everyone thinks that their idea is the best, and it's going <laughs> to work, and that's, you know, that's really great. And it's going to be an interesting, let's say, five years now, as people are investing, you know, good amount of money and trying to push the technology forward to see what hardware works, see what kind of management, what mm -hmm. styles work, 
and uh, we're just going to have to see what happens. And, and we have to, see, yeah, just we get to see what, what works in the next few years, and it'll be very nice. And, you know, when, when I go to conferences and learn what we're doing, even what we're doing here, I'm always picking up and learning things and trying to see what, what is working around the world to see if, you know, that's going to help our program, uh, too. So, again, that just makes it very sci scientifically yeah. extremely interesting to figure this out. Pat. In terms of the landscape, uh, there is also a lot of startups you know, springing into the game uh, of quantum computing, mainly in the, the, the software sphere. Uh, but uh, I'm sure some of you have heard that even the US government is putting, putting out this, uh, this national quantum initiative. Hmm. So there might be some additional funding towards quantum technologies overall. Is that new? I must confess, I haven't heard of it. I think it was a month or two ago. Oh, okay. Yes, there so was a drill not too bad that I hadn't heard. <laughs> um, well, I'd like to, I want to make sure that we really have time to dig into um, this next question, because I think it might be, well, I'm certainly interested in it, and I think it, other people may be too. Um, and this question is, what is the worst misconception that's out there about quantum computing? Um, and I, I wondered which of you would like to take a, a I step. think the worst misconception, or oh, do you want no, to? go ahead. Okay, sorry, yeah. Is that quantum computers are just extremely powerful general purpose machine. Once we have a quantum computer, everything will go exponentially faster. That's a naive interpretation that because, because we think that a single qubit is in two states and 10 qubits in a thousand state and when I have 100 qubits, I mean two to the 100 state and I compute in those two to the 100 states in parallel. So I'm exponentially faster. That is until I start to look at the result. You may have heard about the Schrodinger cat, which is basically zero and one at the same time. It's dead and uh, life uh, at the same time. <laughs> have you ever seen a Schrodinger cat? No, <laughs> when you look at the cat, it's either dead or alive. And so when you take a qubit and you look at it, you read it out, it's either zero or one. So maybe able to do this enormous exponential superposition of all possible calculations once. Then at the end, I look at it, and the quantum computer just randomly gives me one of the answers, and not exponentially many. And that one I could just have done classically by just picking one to start with. <laughs> so the challenge in quantum software well, here, in quantum algorithms, is to actually take this exponential superposition that they cannot read easily and turn that into a useful number by amplifying the answer I want, by just finding the little bit of information out of the state that, that's useful. And that's a big challenge. Is that sort of a programming challenge that people have faced before, or is that new? That is the new concept, because classically, you can always look at the state of the machine. Quantum mechanically, when they look at the qubit, okay, then it's destroyed, it's a classical bit. Mm. So this is new, and that's a totally new mindset we need to think about this superposition, this wave function, this wave. And we need more people to start working on that and play with it. For example, on the, 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 the quantum the, 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 the experience, or on the, 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 the simulator that, that uh, be released mm. and get some feeling for that mm. and have a breakthrough in that. What I say for that, actually, we need quantum toys for babies. <laughs> because <laughs> babies look at the, get the cup and it's here, and it's always the same, and they hone their classical intuition, when instead we should let them hone their quantum intuition. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be very interested to see what that is. <laughs> there are actually, yeah. there's a series of books, Quantum Computing for, for Babies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Pat, I know you have an answer about the, the worst misconception, but John, did you want to speak uh, to that? Okay, Pat, maybe you could share. I think we, we all agree that I, 
the biggest one of the biggest misconceptions is is that it's all the number of qubits is all what matters. It, it's it's simply not. You know, as as John mentioned before, it's the error rates. We have to work to minimize them. It's the connectivity. It's also what kind of software and compilers you use, and all of that can be basically characterized by one word or two words: quantum volume. So I'm, I'm just going to paraphrase Jay and, and his team who, who came up with that metric. And it would be nice to have that one standardized figure of merit where we can basically take a given quantum computer made by whoever, apply that metric, metric to it, and then we'll, we'll tell us, OK, this performance, this depth of the circuit, or, or, or the performance of the quantum processor is such and such. And that will give us sort of a universal comparison. Mm. And then the second one, um, I personally think that a lot of a lot of you think that it's just simply an engineering challenge, and and that is a misconception. It, it's not, it, engineering is very important, but it's not only an engineering challenge right now. It's it's a little bit more. We we still have a far way to go, even in terms of understanding the underlying physics behind the decoherence and and, and errors. With with that point that that it is both uh, scientific discovery and engineering work, does that make the prediction of kind of timelines to commercialization and um, to to different kind of mileposts along the way, does that make it much more difficult to anticipate? <laughs> That's one of the big challenges we face as we merge academic culture with corporate culture. Huh. With how we learn that milestones are important for a company and for the finances, but as we also need to tell them there's still basic science involved, and it's hard to predict that we will make this breakthrough invention next year and we'll get the Nobel Prize in three years. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this is a great learning experience. Yeah. But, but, uh, both sides. I, I was just going to yeah. say um, the nature of these, um, these qubits actually makes a difference on how you run your group. It's kind of yeah. a funny thing. And the idea is in this quantum information, you can't copy information. Okay, It's fundamentally impossible. And then you have to design the, the computer in a different way. And this actually has ramifications on how you run your group. And the idea being is, let's say you're building a normal computer. You can assign a group of people for the CPU and a group of people for the memory and a group of people for the I.O. And they design their systems. And then they communicate the information over a bus to do that. Well, when you can't copy information, you can't do it that way. And in fact, you, the CPU and the memory and the I.O., it's kind of the same team because you're sharing the information. Mm -hmm all the time. And by not being able to, you, you still separate out functions, of course. But because everything is kind of interacting with everything, uh, the, the important thing is that you make sure that everyone on your team really kind of understands what's going on globally. Mm -hmm. And we find that you, know, you have to find physicists who are comfortable being engineers and engineers who are comfortable with the physics. And you have to have very good uh, team coordination and communication. And more or less, everyone kind of has to understand how it works so that when they're designing something, they aren't messing up whatever the person down the hall is doing, doing with that. Mm. And it kind of makes it an interesting challenge. I don't know if this is going to be a practical problem of enormous scale or not. <laughs> but I do find, as a, as a leader of the group, that we really try to get people to understand things better. And it makes it really interesting and fun for everyone. Mm. I'm not sure if I understand your question. What is the time of commercialization? If, if, if you define commercialization as something where we build a product or a service and sell, and sell it to the clients, that already happened. It's called IBMQ.com. Mm -hmm. So we have commercial devices, and we have clients working and partners working with us to use that service. Fair enough. Um, and it's probably a blurry line commercialization, right? Because there's already been um, a commercialized uh, quantum analog computers mm -hmm. um, that are out in the world. So good point. Yeah. I guess the uh, further commercialization <laughs> would be the sharpening of that question. Um, and. Um, 
I think I'll close with maybe an unfair question of my own to stop my questions before turning on to uh, the turning to the questions from the audience, and that is just as you know, as all of us outside of this research community are are you know reading about it and hearing about it, you know, what do you think as just for us as you know, citizens of the world, what are the most important things for us to, to know about and keep in mind about quantum computing as it is today? If you had one takeaway that people should, you would like people to go away with. Kiskit.org, <laughs> which is the quantum information science kit uh, open source software. I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, you should just be aware that the time has come right now, <laughs> that the quantum computing is out there, and you can reach out, find your favorite flavor of quantum architecture, play with it, and, and spread the message. Tell, tell your children, tell your nephews, nieces, that this is the future. And it's amazing, and it's, it's fascinating, and they should get on it. So I'd say being here in this museum, when you look back at the history of computing, then the oldest machines, the, old, the abacus, <laughs> works on the same principle as the most modern, fastest classical CPU. <laughs> it's discrete digital logic. There's been no change in the way we compute for the last 5,000 years. Mm. And now is the time when this is changing, because with quantum computing, we are radically changing the way we use nature to compute. I think that's what makes it so exciting for us to really start this quantum future of computing, to, change, to start to change how we think about computing and how we actually build products that do that. Fascinating. John. And then I agree with all that. And maybe this is more directed for people who are more funding the quantum mm -hmm. computing. <laughs> <laughs> but I think people will understand it. And because it's new, as yeah. you rightfully point out, it's going to take us a while to figure out how to do everything, both mm -hmm. in the hardware and software. And we've been working on this, well, I've been working on it since the 80s, so it's been a long time. There's a lot of interesting things going on. We're making rapid progress. But it might take, take more time to figure this out. And I think people should not get the idea that if we don't get this thing working in the next few years and this short time scale, mm -hmm. then it's never going to work. This is fundamentally different. It's going to take some time. We have to think about it very carefully. But I think we're going to be continuing making the progress. And you know, I think we all feel optimistic we eventually get something. Things. But it may take some time to get it all sorted out and figure out how to use it properly. Yeah. And it may take the next generation mm -hmm. to you know, be more familiar with yeah. quantum mechanics mm -hmm. to know how to program mm -hmm. it well. And that's, of course, very interesting to see where it goes. But I don't want to wait another 5,000 years. No, I no. want to see it happen <laughs> I think in my lifetime. Faster, and I'm confident yeah. we'll have it. Well, I, I think we may have a question at the top of this stack of question cards. And it is a thick stack of questions. So, um, <laughs> But I think this may be from one of the uh, rising generation who's going to have to figure out how to use these quantum computers. And I don't know if this is a, a joyous or a frightening question. And it asks, uh, how would a quantum uh, computer run Minecraft? <laughs> I think Google has something to say on that. Uh, no, I don't. No. <laughs> I think that's for you. What, what is this? <laughs> there is a, a mod for Minecraft that uses quantum effects in, in Minecraft. Okay, really? Yeah. Oh. yeah. Okay. Made by know. Google, yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> About five years ago. <laughs> okay. okay, good. But it does get to the point, I think, that, that we were talking about that, um, that uh, the quantum computers will be kind of this you know, specialized uh, yeah. adjunct to conventional computing. We won't be running Minecraft yeah. on a quantum computer, but I'm not, except yeah. maybe for certain mods. I'm not sure, because what drives classical computings? <laughs> no. Why do we have GPUs? Because people wanted faster machines for gaming. So if we're saying maybe the killer market, the killer app, will not be chemistry, maybe it will be quantum games, <laughs> quantum social networks. 
Well, well yes, but you, you also need faster computers or servers for financial operations and stuff like that. You, you games know. would be fun. <laughs> games are more fun, yeah. I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> I'd prefer Minecraft to high-frequency <laughs> trading myself. Yeah, right. Um, let's see. We kind of talked about that. There's the what would a quantum computer, what use would a quantum computer have for the average American? It might not be directly, but indirectly through the use of others. I would, would say if we invent new materials, new catalysts, if we find a catalyst to capture carbon from the air and solve global warming, that has a huge, a huge impact. So it will be through the problems we solve with quantum computers. Oh, if we come up with new drug development or something like that, which can drug development, mm -hmm. which can cure yeah. certain diseases, quantum chemistry in short. Right, enabling science and medicine discovery. John, you had a um, it's, you, The quantum computers we're building right now and in the future are going to look like supercomputers, and they're going to look like a computer you would put in a data center. And uh, of course, you know, I think everyone probably knows this, but you're probably not turning on your personal computer at home very much anymore. You're using your cell phones, and those cell phones are using data centers. Mm -hmm. So the use of a quantum computer might be pretty transparent to how you're using your cell phone right now when you do data center yeah. computing. Now, if, for example, we can solve you know, optimization problems with a quantum computer, and maybe make better artificial intelligence and machine learning models, then in, you, you, know, you might be using a quantum computer, or a quantum computer will have touched uh, a lot of the, the problems that you want to solve you know, day to day. I mean, we have to, of course, found the algorithms and do that, yeah. but there's a potential that it can really mm -hmm. touch us, you know, maybe at least in a small way, but an important way, uh, if, if that can happen. Um. This question asks, uh, China announced a quantum communications backbone. Um, what's the significance of this? Um, I, I don't know about that announcement yeah. myself, but any comment on that? Mm -hmm. Or about the yeah. use of th this kind of quantum technology for communications? Yeah. You want to talk you, okay, yeah. yeah, so you can use quantum mechanics not only for computing, but also for communication. When you take two qubits, and in that case in photons, and you entangle them, that means they're in the same state, then they can be in the same random state. And when you share them, when I... take one of them, mm -hmm. and you have one. Yep. When I measure mine, I get the random answer. When you measure yours, you also get the random answer, but you get the same random answer. And that we can use to build up the same sequence of random numbers that we can use as a one-time pad to encrypt data in an unbreakable way. That's called called near quantum encryption. Mm -hmm. China has built a network in the country to actually use that. And they also use that with, that with satellites, hmm. up to space and back down. And do we know if, are there any other known deployments of those sort of uh, communications applications outside of China? People yeah. have done uh, smaller versions of this, uh, you know, academic yeah. groups in the past. Yeah. And what was impressive about the Chinese group is that they, you know, did it through a communication mm -hmm. satellite and yeah. through space. And then there might have been some secret programs that yeah. work on it, but of course yeah. we don't know about right. it. Right. But I would say this application is to um, um, be able to communicate uh, in secret using kind of physical means mm -hmm. to protect the, the secrecy. Yeah. Mm. And there's going to be cases for the government or military yeah. where maybe you want that added degree of security. Uh, the problem is it's a pretty high cost, and uh, the cost per bit is high, the transmission rates, rates are low, uh, and at least in, in the foreseeable future, that's not going yeah. to affect the, the normal yeah. people. 
I think companies like Google are, you know, uh, spending, you know, their effort in trying to uh, make more secure uh, their networks, especially, you know, networks to the so to the to a cell phone, uh, which is yeah. what most people use for secure transactions. Yeah. And that's a, you know, that's a, just a whole different uh, area of, of security. Yeah, got uh, it. So it's, it's kind of looking at different applications yeah. uh, in, in doing that. One challenge is we don't yet have quantum repeaters. So you can send it for about 50 miles, and then you again have the, the, the message here there in plain text. Mm. The way China solves the problem is every 50 miles, they have a military base. <laughs> and guards around, <laughs> or they send it up to space because who can eavesdrop on a satellite? Mm. Right, but Only it's, somebody it's not yet at the point where it's really a scalable t t t t t t t technology, and we have pretty good classical encryption that that works well. Pat, I want I wanted to address this next question to you since you were commending people to kind of you know, connect with quantum computing now, through, and in particular through some of the resources that IBM has made available. This question is, um, you know, what should a high school or college student study, presumably, if they want to connect with this kind of world? What would you say to that? At a high school level, mathematics, physics. No, that's a simple answer. <laughs> <laughs> Not history, come on. <laughs> <laughs> also history. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they can already actually start right now. They don't really need to know a great deal of quantum computing or, or, or quantum algorithms or quantum software in order to start using uh, IBM's first uh, uh, small quantum com computers under the quantum experience umbrella. They can just go to IBM quantum experience website we have a lot of tutorials. We have a, a lot of instructions and explanations, and also history of quantum computing. You know, a, a lot of videos um, where even Charlie Bennett is, is talking about quantum computing, and a lot of other IBM researchers giving you explanations of very fundamental facts, as, uh, like superposition state, uh, entanglement, and so on. But also, Qiskit uh, quantum computing software created by IBM. It's so intuitive and simple to use that you can basically drag and drop different quantum gates and create different simple quantum circuits, which you can then execute. And you have two choices. You can run a quantum simulator, which we have on the cloud as well, or you can send that simple circuit, quantum circuit or quantum program, to an actual quantum computer, which we host up in Yorktown Heights, New York, and we maintain it. Uh, we have two of them, five and 16 qubits, and you can execute that program on a quantum computer, and within a few minutes you get an answer. And that's how we can educate yourself and build, build an intuition to what it means uh, to create a superposition or entanglement state and so on. Start using one is a pretty cool answer. <laughs> Do, any other, any I, other I ideas? I was just going to approach it uh, kind of in more in terms of a career and classes that you take. Um, we hire uh, a wide variety of engineers and also physicists, scientists uh, in our project. And uh, we need uh, people uh, with all those different skills. What I would say is we tend to want to hire um, the physicists who have, uh, you know, of course, taken quantum mechanics and understand quantum mechanics or do take in quantum information uh, classes, uh, but also a physicist who uh, kind of have a little bit more engineering background yeah. so that they can uh, work on a team where you, you have to build all this technology. Uh, also, in terms of the engineering uh, uh, students, uh, uh, um, you know, you have to be good at your engineering discipline, but also maybe taken uh, some physics classes and taken some quantum mechanics so that you can understand the concepts uh, a, a little bit. Uh, but it, I would say the, the, the thing that's really interesting about how, who we look for is we're looking for scientists, kind of scientists, engineers, people who can cross both domains uh, carefully and think as an engineer when you need to and think as a scientist and taking kind of a more, uh, you know, broad, broad classes and getting that experience uh, is important. And like I say, there's a wide variety of things yeah. we have to do. You have to understand the whole system. So having that broad knowledge uh, is, is really helpful. 
Yeah, so I, I fully agree with what you said. And we find that we need people, yeah, who are mathematicians and physicists and people from chemistry and engineering and computer science and all. But mostly we need people who have, have the open mind and who can solve problems. Mm. Because you need to solve problems to build a machine and you need to want to solve problems to use it later on. <laughs> and so just brilliant people who like to do interesting, challenging things. And when we are stuck sometimes and it's hard going, then we think, how easy would it be to just send a spaceship to Mars? <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's when they say, hey, we have the much more exciting project. So you really have to want to solve really challenging problems. Uh, I also to want to, uh, to mention, if you want to learn how to program quantum hardware, there's QuizKit. There's also the, the, the QDK, the Quantum D Development Kit for, uh, for Microsoft, which is uh, integrated in to Visual Studio, in which you can make a download now for free. It comes with the like, programming language, simulator, debugger. You look at the, the, the quantum state, debug it. <laughs> and you mix it with classical code in C-sharp, in F-sharp, in C, in Fortran even, if you want to go back to that. <laughs> you can do hybrid Fortran like, quantum like program. And we found that it's super important because until people started writing actual code, hmm. Many of the algorithms we saw published in papers, when you try to implement them, don't work. Huh. Because when you write code on paper and never run it, then you don't find the subtle mistakes in them. So learning to write quantum code now in high school is a great starting point. <laughs> <laughs> and then at some point, you will want to build a faster, better machine and help John and us and IBM to build it. Um. This is a very interesting question. I'll paraphrase it. You know, is quantum computing sort of a Bitcoin killer? What does the, uh, the existence <laughs> of a quantum computer say for the viability of cryptocurrencies of all kinds? Our team has published a paper last year oh. <laughs> that actually shows that with 2,330 qubits, you can crack the encryption behind Bitcoin. <laughs> And we tend to choke that once we have such a machine, that will fund all of our program. <laughs> <laughs> but what it means is that we will have to move to, 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 to cryptography that is quantum resistant. Mm. Those schemes exist, and so we will be able to switch to that. The reason why we have not switched yet is that before you deploy a new crypto system, you want to make sure that you cannot crack it classically. Mm. So it wants to delay it as long as possible and wait until everyone has tried to crack it for 20 years. Mm. Even the best people, including, the, including some agencies, mm -hmm. have tried it for decades and failed, then you start trusting it. But what it also means, maybe more importantly, if you have a secret today that you don't, don't want anybody to know in the next 25 years, then don't encrypt it with RSA if you believe that we'll build a machine that <laughs> can crack it in the next years. So it has impact already now on long-term cryptography, mm -hmm. not for e-banking. But there is also some new, new codes, uh, lattice-based yep, cryptography. Exactly. Yeah. But we need to find out where they say, what are the key size we need, and so on. And that's work in progress. Yeah. But I think that's an important yeah. point, maybe just to draw out that I had the benefit of talking with you guys while we were waiting to come out here, that there, that there are um, different kinds of schemes for encryption that a conventional electronic digital computer can do that yeah. seem to be resistant to the sort of um, uh, attacks that a quantum computer could do on these factoring of yeah. prime number sort of schemes. So it's just at the moment, 
maybe. At, at least we know that now. I yeah. mean, you know, clearly, you know, this is the kind of thing where these are, uh, as, as smart people think about it, they some kind, uh, sometimes find right. uh, ways to get around it. But that's true of any uh, crypto yeah. system. Sure. Yeah. Except to one-time pads, they will stay yeah, secure. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's very, it's very secure. Let's see. Um, there's a question about um, the, the funding for um, corporate research in quantum computing. Is that also in part funded by the government, or is it um, so, simply by the corporation? No. So at IBM, uh, we do have government uh, projects, and, and you can look them up. One of them is under IARPA, uh -huh. where we're trying to build one logical qubit based on you know, 17 physical qubits. We also have a LPS funding for quantum validation and verification. So it's, it's a mix of both. Mm -hmm. at, at Google, we're a totally funded uh, internally by Google. OK. And the same at Microsoft. Microsoft, yeah. OK. Just, I know we have limited time left, so I'm sort of sorting through these questions. Bear with me. Um, another one about encryption. Hmm. Here's an interesting question that that um, that does speak to 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 narratives and discussions that are kind of out there around quantum computing. Um, this uh, discussant writes: I understand um, computers and how a human brain can be equated to a computer. How does a quantum computer equate to a human brain? So, um, hmm. any is there anything? I mean, this is something that's out there in kind of popular discussions. Is, is it too early to, to think about this? Or is there, what do you think? There, there, there are some proposals out there yeah. that there are some quantum kind of processing going in with certain molecules yes. in the brain. Right. Uh, and, you know, may, I, my personal opinion is that may be happening at some small scale. Yeah. But these quantum computers are so hard to build and so kind of fragile that it's hard to imagine something as kind of wet and messy as the, as the, as the brain. <laughs> yeah. But you know, we don't, we don't know. I mean, yeah. it, we're still, people are researching it. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have a comment yeah, I, on that? I agree. OK. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's see. Another one about cryptography. I guess that's, um, uh, yeah. Uh, how is a, uh, this is a question coming from Facebook, so thank you. Um, how is a quantum computer programmed currently, and what does the interface for the human being look like? For those who haven't had a try <laughs> yet on the, the IBM or the Microsoft opportunities, um, maybe paint a picture for Sim that person. Simply and shortly, since we're running out of time. Uh, on the uh, IBM Quantum Experience website, if you log in there, you can create your account. And depending whether you, you want to play with the five or 16 qubit quantum processor, you will have five lines, you know, like, like in music, if you, if you play instruments. And then on the right, you will have gates. And those gates are your quantum operations. And they will be in the form of squares or circles. So you can basically drag and drop those gates according to what you want to accomplish onto qubit number one, which would be the top, very top line, qubit number two, second, third, and so on. And you can create your quantum circuits in this simple, very simplistic way by dragging and dropping. And then it, somewhere at the end, you can put a, a circle, which will be your measurement, and that will perform the measurements and give you an output. Yeah, I think one of the beautiful things about quantum computing, I find, is that um, the way that you think about operating this is really quite close to how you would design a regular digital circuit. Hmm. And you have gates and connections and, and the like. Now, what happens is instead of having, you know, not gates and AND gates, we have these control Zs and C naughts and Hadamard rotations. We have another gate set, okay? Uh, it's, and it's just richer than the classical gate yeah. set. And then what you have to do is just learn uh, by experience and, and, and study uh, what you do for those gates. But you kind of put together your circuit in the way that you would uh, do with a classical circuit, more or less. Uh, and, uh, and, and you can write code and cir circuits, and you yeah. can write 
uh, a compiled code that looks quite similar to that. And because of that, it's kind of, you, you have to learn something, but it's not this gigantic leap to understand mm. how to physically code it. Of course, you have to understand how the algorithm works, and that's yeah. difficult. Right. Yes. So that's the, 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 the low level failure approach that uh, one starts with when one is 5 qubits, 10, 20. And classically, you can also write all your code just based on NAND gates. And we may have <laughs> written a 2-bit adder, but when it comes to a 32-bit adder or a multiplier or a nice function, then I prefer not to write it at the gate level. <laughs> and so we have developed like a higher level language that looks kind of like C sharp and F sharp and that then compiles down to the circuits. Interesting. So in the end, the code basically looks like what you're uh, used to writing, but you also have a qubit data type and a quantum register data type mm -hmm. and operation on them. And you call a Fourier transform on it and you call a Grover search, you call a Shor's algorithm for factoring <laughs> just as a subroutine in a library. So. Uh, at the high level, it looks just like we're used to programming, but you have to learn kind of what these quantum operations can do and find how it can be applied to solving a problem. Well, I think our time is running out. Um, I feel like I've just learned so much this evening. I'm sure everybody else does too. It was just such a unique opportunity. So everybody, why don't you thank me, uh, join me in thanking our guests. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Yeah. Thank you.